Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, welcome back to this lecture number 18 in the series on human behavior. What we did in the last lecture is we looked at an another interesting variable which affects human behavior and that interesting variable was personality. What we will do today is continue with that variable, look at the several theories of personality and then look at how to measure personality and now now by discussing the impact of personality on human behavior. But before we jump there, as we have been doing in other uh, lectures as well, in order to uh, maintain continuity, let us focus a little bit back to when we started the lecture. So, what I will do is I will do a quick, very quick review of how we started and how did we reach here. So, I started off by describing what is human behavior and then describing why we should study human behavior. I looked at the science of psychology which is used for studying human behavior. I also described a number of problems in studying of human behavior and some of the basics question which lie in the study of human behavior. One of these basic questions is the nature nurture problem and several other uh, basic questions in the study of psychology. We looked at how psychology developed as a science and how its roots came from philosophy and physiology. We looked at the history of psychology, several schools of psychology, several approaches of doing psychology and newer schools of psychology. Then we focused on tools and methods which psychology provide us to study human behavior. Once we were done with that, we moved on to the idea of how information from the external world, changes in the external world are captured by humans. So, we looked at those devices and processes which capture changes in external world into the psychological medium, into the psychological realm. We described the primary characteristics of sensory systems, looked at sensitivity and sensory coding. We looked at how the process of signal detection eliminates noise or unwanted signals from external stimuluses which have been encoded through the sensory system. Then we looked at a model system which is the human eye and how does the human eye function and does whatever theory we had actually proposed. We next move to the idea of perception which is making meaning out of sensory knowledge which has been gathered by the sensory system. We looked at the five basic principles of perception starting from attention to localization, the process of pattern matching or recognition and then two basic processes of abstraction and constancy which are used by the human brain to make meaning out of sensory impulses, sensory information which has been encoded by the sensory processes or the sensory system. Once a meaning has been generated, this meaning has to be kept somewhere, it has to be updated 
or it, it has to be included into the already present knowledge and the process of including this meaning into the already present representations or knowledge is called learning. So, we looked at what is learning, we looked at the associative and the non-associative forms of learning, we looked at classical conditioning, instrumental conditioning and observation learning in detail and we looked at all parameters, functions, principles, factors which govern the learning principle. Once something is learned, it is stored for later use. The process of memory is what we dealt next, where we discussed how information is stored which has been learned. We looked at the parallel processing model and the atkinson schiffen model of memory. We looked at what is working memory and we also looked at the long term memory. We looked at what information is stored in memory, what kind of information manipulations happens in long term memory and the various factors and parameters which guide memory. Once we have memory of information which has been captured by sensory system and interpreted by the perceptual systems, this has to be communicated to other people as well. Also we need to gather some information from other people through the use of language. So, the next focus was on discussing what is language, how information is transferred between intelligent beings. We looked at the English language and described how language is used to communicate between people and transfer ideas between people. We looked in detail some of the principles of language and some of the issues of language. We then on moved on to the idea of thinking which is the language of the mind. We looked at how thinking progresses, how meaning generated by perceptual systems are evaluated and decisions made out of it. So, we looked at reasoning process which is evaluating meaning and dec making decisions through it. We looked at the uh, inductive and deductive reasoning processes. Further, we also looked at the process of categorization and concept formation which is used for organizing stimuli together and generating meaning out of it. We looked at the process of problem solving which is how we solve day to day and special problems. Once done with it, we focused our attention on to higher order cognitive processes. We looked at what is intelligence because intelligence has been uh, termed as a factor which affects human abilities. We described several models of intelligence, different con models, contrasted those models, looked at how intelligence is measured, looked at the various parameters of uh, intelligence, various factors affecting intelligence and the end of it took a model system which is emotional intelligence and creativity and looked at how these models are studied or intelligence is studied and what kind of effect would it have on human behavior. We looked at the idea of emotion because emotions do affect our human behavior. We looked at various theories of emotion and how these theories propose how emotions are generated. Further to it, we looked at the classical model of emotion, the various processes in it and how it leads to a response. We looked at how responses, emotional responses are controlled and manipulated by humans and we looked at the effect of emotion on thinking, memory, judgment, problem solving and so on and so forth which is basically how emotions control human behavior. The last in this section is personality. So, in the last section we looked at what is personality and how does personality affect human behavior. We looked at the definition of personality, we looked at whether it is real or not and then we discussed a classical theory of personality which is the Freud psychoanalytic theory. Today what we are going to do is we are going to extend this discussion into other theories of personality and towards the end of this session we will look at various measures of measuring personality. So, if you remember from the last class, personality is defined as a relatively stable pattern of behavior of people which is consistent across situations. Freud defined this personality coming from the unconscious and his idea of personality is divided into four terms which is 
the knowledge about the unconscious of how unconscious and conscious and uh, subconscious processes in the mind shape personality. His idea of what is the id, the ego and the super ego and how the fight between them leads to changes in personality and uh, personality characteristics. The idea of how defense mechanisms lead to the development of personality and the idea of how getting stuck or passing on through several stages of development lead to personality. We also looked at the idea of collective unconscious striving for success, introvert extrovertness and the idea of birth order which were all given by either young and older which were the new Freudians and how these processes affect personality. We will start today afresh with the humanistic theory of personality. So, let us get on to our humanistic theory of personality. Now, Freud's idea of personality evolved from the concept of human understanding or medical science which believes that human beings are evil by nature. They are disordered to start with and so why would you go and meet a doctor? No doctor would actually say that you are disordered in, uh, in well in any way, they will find out some disorder. Similarly, psychologists if you go meet them they will say that you have some personality problem or some other problem. So, these sciences, these approaches believe that human beings to start with have disorders or they are a little bit evil on the evil side and this evilness or disorderness come from the fight for existence. So, all their propositions start by looking at cures for personality problems. The humanistic psychologists believe that this view is not correct. They believe that human beings are born good and always strive or always try to become good. Their idea of personality stems from the fact that human beings are not only born good, but they work all their lives to actually do good things. So, what is the humanistic approach then? The main proponent of humanistic approach or the main idea behind uh, humanistic approach is that alternatives to psychoanalytic and behavioral approaches. The humanistic approach is an alternative to the psychoanalytic and behavioral approaches and the main interest is person's subjective experiences. What the humanistic psychologists believe that personality stems from the idea that people are born good and personality cannot be measured through the ways that Freud had suggested. Personality comes from personal experiences and if you want to study uh, personality we need to understand or reveal this personal subjective experiences of people. People's personal experiences with the world actually lead to the idea of personality. It has nothing to do with the fight between inconsistent or non-existent parts like id, ego and super ego. Neither it has to do with the idea that there is an unconscious where everything that you do not want reveals. What humanistic theorists believe is that people are born good and they want to be good. And so, if you want to study personality, you have to look at people's personal meaning, people's subjective experiences about situation. Now, two of the main theorists in the humanistic domain were Carl Rogers and Gordon Alport. So, one of the famous theorists of humanistic psychology, main proponents of humanistic psychology was Carl Rogers. Now, Carl Rogers was a medical person and so he practiced medicine and he defined for the first time a type of theory which is called the client centered therapy, where he focused on the idea that personalities or personality problems can be studied by looking at people's experiences with the world. Personality problems arises from something called the idea of self and so we will look into how this self develops personality. So, the basic force motivating humans is actualizing tendency a person's motivation to enhance oneself. Carl Rogers believe that people are born good and people want to be good. And so, what motivates people to do things is the actualizing tendency. What is the actualizing tendency? The actualizing tendency is a tendency where people want to achieve the highest possible stage, highest possible point that they can attain in their life. They want to actualize, they want to work towards, strive towards success. They want to 
achieve the unachievable and that is the actualizing tendency they want to actualize themselves and people's ability or people's motivation how motivated someone is to achieve this actualizing tendency is plays a key role into their personality dynamics now carl rogers believe that each person is composed of a self he gave the idea of self now what most people when we introduce ourselves we use something called borrowed notions we are never aware of the self that we have if if i ask you today who are you you will tell me myself this and this and i come from this and this so we use borrowed perceptions or we use uh, borrowed meanings from other institute for example if i say i am so and so from iit what i am actually doing as i am borrowing the glory of iit with me most people are not aware of who they are and so carl rogers for the first time define the idea of self self is something that you feel when you stand before a mirror and ask who you are not the name not whom you are associated with not where you come from not what you like or you don't like not what you have achieved so self according to uh, carl rogers is the ideas perceptions and values that characterize me and this perceived self influences person's perceptions of the world and behavior so what carl rogers says is that the idea of self is perceptions values and ideas that people have about themselves about me when i ask you who you are or when you describe yourself the perceptions that you describe the values that you relate that you tell you own or you have the ideas that you have about who you are is actually what is the self is and this perceived self then influences person's perception of the world and their behavior the more self reliant you are the more aware you are about yourself the better you will actually succeed in this world now carl rogers defined this self or divided this self into three parts there is something called the ideal self there is something called the actual self and there is something called the real self now of course in this particular example we are using the actual self and the real self together and what carl rogers means is that people at all points of time are pretending they are pretending because they want to be liked with people they are pretending because because they want to be something they don't reveal their true selves this true self is only evident to that person so real self is what you actually are actual self is what you pretend to be nobody actually shows their real self so example let's say that i'm weak in mathematics but in a mathematics class i'll try to do all those actions all those acts which will prove that i am a good student in mathematics so the copying that i do or the behavior that i show in that particular class just to be in par with other students who are good in mathematics is what is the actual self but my real self is that part which is i know that i am weak in mathematics ideal self on the other hand is the self that i want to be i want to be very good in mathematics but i am not so what i do is i do pretensions the more different there is between who you are and who you want to be or who you are and who you pretend to be these differences is what is the cause of personality problems or personality characteristics so what carl rogers says is that the discrepancy between self and ideal self results in anxiety when you know who you are when you know who you really are and who you want to be and the more the difference is let's say i am very normal in mathematics but i want to be very good in mathematics and i know i cannot be because those numbers and values cannot or do not take uh, make meaning for me the more the difference between i pretend that i am my ideal self and move away from my real self i pretend through certain acts that i am good in mathematics but i know that i am not good in mathematics the more the difference between the more i accept my pretensions and don't accept my real self that i am weak in mathematics this will lead to more anxieties and these anxieties will lead to more personality problems now children need to grow up with something called unconditional positive regard in order to function effectively now how does these discrepancies between the ideal self and the real self actually come up one of the reasons that carl rogers suggest is how children are brought up or 
how they are treated when they are growing. What Karl Raja suggests is that children should be brought up or when, when they are growing they should be treated with something called unconditional positive regard. What is unconditional positive regard? In unconditional positive regard parents actually love the children no matter who they are. So, even if the children are not doing good, they are loved, there, there is no limitation, there is no condition put in their love. For example, if you pass only then I love you, that kind of a thing is not there. And so, there has to be a balance between this. You cannot be loving your children too much, so that even if he does something bad, you love them. But even if the children do not do good, you do not hate them. So, unconditional positive regard is a type of parenting in which people are encouraged to bring up their children by loving them no matter who they are, but within certain boundaries. right? So, even if they do bad in tests, exams, they are still given hope saying that okay, you can do uh, good tomorrow, but I will love you for that. You do not hate people. On the other hand, you do not be too lenient so that they do anything and you love them. So, this kind of un if you bring your children up through unconditional positive regard, you the discrepancy between ideal self and real self will be very less. Also, measuring real self is congruence. So, how is real self measured? It is based on something called the Q sort met method, where correlations between two sorts reveals the degree of incongruence between real and ideal self can represent Q sorts to effectively in therapy. Now, there is a method of Q sort which will not, since it is a little bit uh, technical, so we will not be doing it, but a Q sort method is used and correlations between real and ideal self between two sorts or between two personality dynamics which are put on paper on cards, the two sorts. So, your personality dynamics are put on cards and uh, your personalities are values or features are put on cards and then they are sorted in, in a queue. And so, from there you have to pick something and so, there is there is a queue sort method and the more the correlation that they show that defines your ideal self and the real self, but we will not go into two details of how this is measured. As you can see, there is incongruence in congruency. The more the difference between the ideal self and the real self, the more the anxiety, the more the problems. The lesser the congruence, incongruence between real self here, a large part is overlapping and so here the anxiety is less. So, in this case when it is incongruent, the self image is different from the ideal self, there is only little overlap, self actualization will be difficult. So, they will not achieve what they want to achieve because they do not feel safe, that is the difference between ideal self and real self. In this case, the self image is similar to the ideal self is more overlap and the person can actually self actualize, the children will achieve what they want to achieve. The next theory in the humanistic domain is called the Abraham Maslow theory which proposes a hierarchy of needs. It is a very simple theory. What Abraham Maslow says is that most people actually moved above this triangle and until and unless they move from the one stage of this triangle to the next or needs are satisfied in any of these sectors within the triangle, the person will never move to the higher level. For example, let us look at the first need that people have is physiological needs. Let us look at a beggar. Now, the first thing that he wants is food, water, a place to live. Now, if he gets these for today, only then he can think about safety, only then he can think about having security and so on and so forth. Otherwise, he will still think of getting food today. Assuming that you give this beggar food and security and you tell him that tomorrow also you will get food, then he can think about belongingness and love and talking to people and making social friends and so on and so forth. Given the fact that he has made friends, he has been promised food through work and then his physiological needs has been satisfied, he can now think about things like self-esteem uh, self to achieve to be competent, to be gaining approval and recognition, only then he can come here. Until unless he has made friends, he had had safety and he had had food, he cannot come here. Once he has achieved this need of esteem, he can think of cognitive needs, so understanding and exploring the world and once he has achieved this need, he actually then looks at aesthetic things and only then once he is done, he moves to the idea of self-actualization, which basically means that here nothing else matters from him, he needs to fulfill and realize his true potential. So, people move from these needs one after another and whenever these needs are satisfied within any of these bracket, people move to the next bracket. Most people actually get stuck in these needs and never move above the self-esteem need or the cognitive need for that matter. Very few people actually self-actualize and what Maslow says is that the more easily you move through this pyramid, the better self-actualization you require and the better their personality tends to be. 
personality is at the lowest level, the personality problems are the highest, at the higher level, the personality problems are to the lowest. And so, principal personality is defined by where in this block are they stuck. The humanistic approach, which is the portrait of human nature, it does not dispute the influence of biological environment on behavior, but emphasizes the individual's own role in defining and creating his own destiny. What the humanistic approach says is that it does not say that biology and environment has no role to play in personality. What it says is that individual's own role and his own destiny defines his personality. Now, an evaluation of this theory says that succeeded in devising new methods for assessing self-concept and emphasizing that they need important problems. So, humanistic theory for the first time was able to move away from Freud's concept of personality and they devised a system of self and a system of measuring this self and studying newer problems of personality. Critics question the quality and evidence of criticizing building theories solely on relatively healthy people. Now, since humanistic theories only worked on healthy people, people who are good, people who are born good and never looked at people who had actually problems. Critics have been criticizing this theory on that point. Another theory that is relevant here is called the trait theory. Now, what is the trait theory? The trait theory believes that personality is governed by certain traits. What are traits? These are stable dimensions of personality along which people vary from low to very high. So, trait is a dimension, trait is a property of a person of persons across which they move. Now, this strong tendency to think about others in terms of specific characteristics is reflected as a the theory of uh, personality. So, trait is a stable dimension, it is a stable characteristic of personality across which most people vary. For example, let us say temperament. Now, across temperament people vary. Some people are hot tempered, some people are low tempered. Similarly, nervousness, anxiety, these are certain traits across which people vary and these traits stable dimensions these are and these traits are what are the parts of trait theory. Now, Alport and Cattle were the first two people who actually started looking for the idea of trait and trait defining personality. Now, Alport concluded that the personality traits can be divided into several categories based on the importance. So, how did Alport and Cattle actually come up with the idea of trait? What they did was they used a technique which is called fact analysis and this fact analysis when they did on a number of traits. So, uh, at one point of time a number of traits had appeared which seemed to define personality. There were a number of researchers and these num number of researchers gave a large number of traits, revealed a large number of dimensions across which personalities can vary. So, what Alport did was he did, uh, he used a technique, statistical technique of fact analysis which looks at intercorrelation between items and based on that group items having similar correlation into chunks, into categories and that is what the fact analysis method does or meaningful categories. So, looking at inter item correlations or looking at within item correlations, Alport came to define that there are three basic categories of traits which exist in uh, psychology. One of these category is called the secondary trait. So, what is the secondary trait? These are the least important and exert relatively weak and limited effects on behavior. Secondary traits are those traits which are the least important trait. These are the traits that you gain through experience. These are the traits which actually change, they are relatively permanent, so they keep on changing. For example, laziness is a trait. So, once you are in school, you are lazy, but then you move ahead in college, you become less lazy, start doing work, job, when you have to be there for 9 to 6, you become lesser and lesser lazy and so on and so forth. So, these are traits which have been acquired and these are traits which are easy to change. Then there are something called the central traits and what are the central traits? These are the most important and they are 5 to 10 traits that are put together account for uniqueness of individual personality. Central traits are the traits which define a person and it remains with a person throughout their life. They are generally 5 or 6, 5 to 10 central traits which are prominent in people and these traits do not vary. For example, nervousness is one of those traits, temperament is one of those traits, the trait of altruism. Now, all these traits are although acquired, altruism is an acquired trait or the trait to be nervous for that matter is a trait which has been acquired is a central in nature. And so, the person who is nervous or who is temperament, this behavior will be shown, this temperament will be shown across several situations. So, these traits are central because they are consistent and they are there with the person all across their life and generally they are 5 to 10 in number. 
Now, there is something called the cardinal trait. Alpert defined the idea, Alpert and Cattle defined the idea of something called cardinal trait. And what is cardinal trait? There are few people who are dominated by a single all important cardinal trait. Cardinal trait is an important trait which defines a person's behavior or a person's doing. And there are very few people in the world who are defined by one generic trait. There are not many people in the world who can be defined by one trait. And this trait is so dominant that it is prevalent, that it is effective, that it is shown in all his behavior. For example, look at Napoleon, the trait that he had was called ambition. No matter what he did for the ambitions, Napoleon is known for no ambition. Or look at Florence Nightingale, the one trait that this lady was known with is empathy. And so, no matter what she did, wherever she went, empathy was one thing. Or Mother Teresa, again empathy was something which is related to her. And so, these, these people were known with one trait. Now, Alpert's concept of functional autonomy, patterns of behavior that are initially acquired under one set of circumstances and which satisfy one set of motives may later be performed for very different reasons. So, Alpert gave the idea of something called functional autonomy. And functional autonomy is a pattern of behavior that one acquires for some other reason at some point of time, but at a later point of time, this behavior is performed for very different reasons. Let us say that when you were small, now at that point of time, you were given chocolates and food and all kind of bribing for studying. So, through that you started studying. The motive there, when you were small, the motive for studying were the rewards which were given to you, were the chocolates which you were waiting and slowly, slowly you developed a liking for reading. Now, at a later age, you buy novels, you buy books and read them for no other reason. You do not get chocolates for reading books or you do not get uh, any kind of appreciation for reading a book and gathering knowledge. Now, one, the behavior that you were doing earlier for some chocolates or other motives now turns out to be a behavior that you actually like. The process of reading itself, the process of gaining it, knowledge itself or the idea of gaining knowledge is the motivating factor and this is what is called functional autonomy. And so, what Alport says is that functional autonomy is one of the major important parts of trait theory. Raymond Cattle, another psychologist from the trait theory background gave another trait theory and what he says is he identifies 16 source traits dimensions of personality that underlie differences in many others less important surface traits. Now, what Raymond Cattle said that he also did his own factor analysis and according to him, he found out two group of traits. He said there are something called source traits, the dimensions of personality that underlie differences in many other less important. So, there are certain primary traits which are source traits and then there are certain less important traits which are called surface traits. So, source traits are the one which shows highest correlation among themselves and surface traits are the one which shows weak correlation among themselves. So, source traits are the primary traits that any person has and surface traits are the secondary traits that people have. Now, these traits that Cattle has named is traits like cool versus warm, traits like easily upset versus calm and stable and so these are the traits that Raymond Cattle actually came up with. McCarr and Costa came up with their own idea of traits or trait theory and they named something called the big five factor dimensions of personality. Now, what McCarr and Costa came up with is called the five factor, it is called the Neo PI or the five factor personality theory. What does the theory suggest? This theory basically suggests the Neo PI or the five factor personality theory suggests that there are five different dimensions of personality and people vary across these dimensions. These dimensions are extraversion, agreeableness, consciousness, emotional stability and openness to experience. Now, these are the different traits as you can see as defined by Alport and Cattle and these are the different traits which are defined by. So, these traits are the neo PI traits. Now, let us look at neuroticism for example. The trait neuroticism, people having neuroticism would be low on, they will be unflappable people, whereas they will be very high on anxiousness and stress. So, people having high on neuroticism will be very high on anxiety and very uh, low on flappability. Similarly, 
the potential to threats and dangers are very high. The relevant situation is that in situations of potential threats and dangers, they will show very high anxiety and uh, low or unflammability and the region of the brain which produces this trait is called the amygdala and the uh, neurotransmitter which is responsible for it is called the serotonin. See, similarly, people on the openness trait, so no, both uh, this neuroticism is a bivariate trait. So, basically there are two ends to it. People can be high on neuroticism and can be also low on neuroticism. Similarly, openness, the openness what does it mean? People who are open, they have low scores on practical, they are less practical and less concrete people, but then they are highly imaginative people and metaphysical people. So, concreteness, they have very low concreteness, but very high imaginability, very high metaphysicality and so on and so forth. Relevant situations in which they can form are words and ideas. This imaginability can be displayed in terms of words, their ideas, they show imaginability, they show metaphysicality, they show less of concreteness and so on and so forth. And mental association mechanism is the mechanism of the brain which is responsible for the highness or lowness of this trait. Similarly, you have the trait of conciseness which is related to uh, low on spontaneity and high on discipline. People who are conscientiousness, they are highly disciplined people, but very less spontaneous. And this is generally demonstrated in situations of planning or achieving a goal. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the area which is responsible for generating this trait. Similarly, the agreeableness trait, in this trait, people low on this trait are unempathetic and people high on this trait are empathetic. Similarly, this trait is commonly displayed when people interact with other people and the theory of the mind mechanisms or different mind mechanisms are responsible for producing this trait. Then we have the trait of extraversion and people who are low on these traits are quiet and stoical whereas people high on this trait are outgoing and enthusiastic. Similarly, in potential reward situations is when this trait show itself and the midbrain dopaminergic reward system is the one system which is responsible for this trait. So, these are five different traits and what I have here is low scores on this trait, what do they mean, high scores on this trait, what this mean and in which situation this trait is prevalent. Also, I have different brain mechanisms which is responsible for creating this kind of a trait. Let us do an evaluation of this trait theory. So, what is the evaluation trait theory approach is largely descriptive in nature. It does not determine how various traits actually develop and how they influence the behavior and why they are important. So, one of the main criticisms of trait theory is that it is very difficult to define what is a trait. How do you discover traits? How do they develop trait? So, it is descriptive in nature. There is no way to know what is the trait. How do we come up with a trait? How do we generate a trait? and how the traits actually influence behavior. So, those, those things are not available to us. Similarly, despite several decades of careful research, there is still no final agreement concerning the basic traits that are the most important and the most basic. Also, one of the problems with trait theory is that decades of research has gone into it, but people are still not clear as to what are the basic traits and what are the non-basic traits. Also, people have not agreed on to one trait to be a basic trait. And so, the question is whether 5 or 7 traits are basic or 6 or 10 traits are basic and then other traits are subsidiary. So, people do not actually know what is a trait and how do you define these uh, things. There is another set of theory which is called the learning set of theories which define personality. And what is the learning theories all about? So, let us look at the learning theories. Now, any learning theory suggests that any personality theory has to account for uniqueness and consistency. Now, personalities are unique and consistent. So, most theories of personality which define personality has to account for this uniqueness and this consistency. As I says that personality are stable patterns of behavior which is unique to a person. So, this uniqueness of a person's personality has to be accounted by any theory of personality which actually tries to express it. Similarly, we have looked at the consistency which basically says that any theory of personality is consistent. So, we have to also acquire for that consistency or have to also give reasons for that consistency. So, any personality theory has to account for uniqueness and consistency of human behavior. Freud explained it in terms of the internal factors whereas, learning theory explains that in terms of learning and experience. So, what Freud says is that this uniqueness and consistency of behavior can be expressed in terms of internal factors, internal fights that happens between the id, ego and super ego. At the unconscious level, the fight between the id, ego and super ego is what relates to the uniqueness of personality that people have and the consistency that they have of these personality dimensions across situations. 
whereas Freud considers these internal factors responsible for personalities, different personalities in the world. What learning theory suggests is that it is the learning experiences and the other different experiences that people have in their life is responsible for this consistency and this uniqueness of personality dimensions. Now, early learning theories took extreme views and determined the importance of denied the importance of any internal factors, motive traits, etc. But recent theories take into account the many aspects of cognition in shaping personality. The earlier theories, the first theories of personality actually never took account of internal factors as motives and traits to be responsible for personality. They believe that personality dimensions or personality comes from simple stimulus association relation. What they believe is that if a particular stimulus leads to a particular response, a person learns this that is called the learned response and that is why he starts behaving in this particular uh, way. We basically means that let us say somebody learns that by getting angry, he can make people do for him whatever he wants. So, he learns this and then he displays these traits over and over again to the point that he is rewarded. So, basically this, this says that it is a simple uh, stimulus reaction thing. This person once he, once he got angry and he could make himself get rewarded by getting angry, he could get whatever he wanted by getting angry. He learned this response and so this response um, is, is repeated in similar situations. But then later personality theories said that it is not so automatic. There are something called traits, there are something called motives, there are something called other internal factors which cognitive factors which play a role in personality or role in stable dimensions of uh, patterns of behavior that people display across situations. Uniqueness, the learning approach contains reflects our distinctive life experiences. Learning approaches says that the uniqueness in people's behavior comes from the distinctive life experiences that people have. Each person goes through their life or venture to their life in many different formats. They have different experiences in life and these different experiences that they go through actually produces the uniqueness of behavior that people have. Consistency is explained by persistence of response, association and habit acquired during learning. Consistency is explained by the learning theory as those actions that people tend to do which rewards them when they do a particular behavior. And so, this consistency comes with the persistence of a response. If they give a response again and again, for example, by being angry, reward someone. So, he does this act again and again and associating this leads to habit formation. So, initially he learns that being angry gives him a reward. Later on, it becomes his habit to become angry, the first thing response to any kind of situation and that leads to the consistency of behavior. Then there is something called the social cognition theory, the modern view of personality and what does this theory actually say? Now, it places great emphasis on the self system, the cognitive processes by which a person perceives, evaluates and regulates his or her own behavior so that it is appropriate in a given situation. So, this theory says, suggests that the self system, the idea of self as proposed by Carl Rogers is responsible for personality dynamics. What it says is, the cognitive process by which a person perceives or evaluates and regulates his or her own behavior so that it becomes appropriate in several situations actually leads to personality. So, how you see yourself and how you control yourself, how you control your behavior in different situations so that the situation becomes adaptive to you, the situation becomes productive to you is what leads you or what leads to your stable pattern of behavior, consistent pattern of behavior across different situations. People generally do not just respond to reinforcements, but also engaged in self reinforcement patting themselves on their back when they achieve a goal. So, it is not that people just look at external reinforcements. If that has been true, then why would people who gain position 2 and 3 in a race would actually run? People also self pat themselves. Although the first person in a race gets a gold medal, but people who come 4 or 5 in a race, why do they run? They run because they self pat themselves. They self reinforce themselves saying that ok, not this time, maybe next time I did good and next time I will do much better. And so, this is one of the reasons why people develop different personalities and different ways of behavior. So, self patting or self commending oneself, self motivating oneself can be one of the responses that people do and that leads them to the consistent pattern of personality that they develop. Observation learning is another important factor which plays a wide role range of human activities. 
observation learning is also responsible for certain kind of personality dimensions or certain kind of behavioral personality dimensions. In essence, any time humans observe others, they can learn from the experiences which in turn shapes their own behavior. So, basically people also learn from other people. If you go to a restaurant and you uh, do not know how to use the fork and the knife, you actually look at other people and when you do that and when you try how other people are uh, eating and that eases your pain or somehow comforts you in, in ways or that eases the way you eat certain things, you learn that behavior then that defines your uh, behavior and you start behaving in a certain manner. So, by copying other people and copying those behaviors which are rewarding, that is also how people develop their behavior or develop certain consistent patterns of responding which is actually called the personality. Another important concept of this theory is called something called self-efficacy and individuals believe that he or she can perform some behavior or task successfully. Self-efficacy is defined as a person's belief in himself whether he can do a job or how well he can do a job. And self-efficacy is another factor which can lead to consistent patterns of behavior. The more self-efficient you are, self-efficacious you are, the more you tend to do a work and the more the chances of success for you because you pay more attention to it. The less self-efficacy you have, the lower your personality dimensions are, the lower more personality problems you feel and so on and so forth. Julian Rotter gave a social learning theory of personality which suggests that the likelihood that a given behavior will occur in a specific situation depends on individual's expectancies concerning the outcome and the behavior will produce and on the reinforcement value they attach to such outcomes, the degree to which they prefer to reinforce over another. So, Julian Rotter believes that people's likelihood of giving a particular behavior or producing a particular behavior depends upon their expectations of what the outcome will be and also what kind of reinforcement value they put to this behavior. The lower the reinforcement value they put to this behavior, the lower the chances this behavior will repeat it. The higher the reinforcement value they put to this behavior, the higher the chance of doing that particular behavior. Also, people's behavior is also dependent on what expectancies do people have. If people have very low expectancies from a certain situation, then what will happen is they will behave in certain manner, but people have higher expectancies from certain situations and then the reward that is given is low, then the behavior will be different. So, if people expect high and high reward is given, the behavior is repeated, but if a, if a expectancy is low and a low reward is given, then it does not matter to uh, people, but a low expectancy and a high reward will lead to very high forms of that behavior. And so, this is what Julian Rotter's idea of social learning theory is. So, behavior is also dependent on your expectancies from certain behavior and also the reinforcement that you get out of that particular behavior. Rotter terms person who strongly believe that they can shape their own destinies and internals and those who believe that the outcomes are largely determined by results of forces outside as externals. So, Rotter says that there are two type of people, one are called the internals who actually believe that the outcomes or the destinies that people acquire are dependent on their internal self. In comparison to them, there are someone called or people called externals who believe that external factors outside of them is responsible for whatever behavior that they are doing or whatever acts that they are doing. Evaluation of the learning approach, so let us quickly look at the evaluation of the learning approach and how the learning approach is, has functioned up till now. The existence of Oedipus complex or attainment of self-actualization are facts with a lot of controversy. Self-actualization which is the highest form of achievement that any person can acquire in his lifetime which is the proponent given by the humanistic theory or Oedipus and Electra complex which are complexes generated during certain stages of development which is generated from the love towards the other sex parent. These are concepts which have been provided by uh, the psychoanalytic theory or the humanistic theory. These are facts, but this they are in a lot of controversy because that has not been proved. In contrast, virtually all the psychologists agreed that the importance of learning in acquiring and modifying behavior. So, what other theories, what the humanistic theories or what uh, the psychoanalytic theory propose, the dimensions that they propose, the concepts that they pr propose are somewhat shaky, are somewhat controversial because they cannot be proved. But the idea that learning and motivation, learning and modification of behavior can lead to people doing, acquiring better personalities has been accepted by many psychologists. Cognitive factors are also are equally viewed in shaping behaviors and in turn determining personality. So, personality is not only affected by 
learning and acquiring and modifying behaviors. Learning and modifying behaviors is the on, not only the one reason of people's personalities, one reason behind people's different personalities, but cognitive factors like the thinking process, like the decision process, like the evaluation process is another factor which is responsible for defining different personalities. Learning theories ignore the importance of inner conflict and the influence of unconscious thoughts and impulses on behavior. Learning theory believes that it is always cognitive. People's behavior is always cognitive and so once a behavior is rewarded, people think over it and then do that behavior again and again. But where they fall lack is the idea of inner conflicts, the conflicts that goes on in the unconscious, the mental conflicts that goes on and that shapes our behavior. Sometimes emotion shapes our behavior. But not a lot of focus has been done on these factors. Emotions or irrationality or uh, some other inner conflicts can also actually shape people's behavior. Depression can shape people's behavior. But these things have not been considered by the learning theories. Now, early learning theories did not credit cognitive factors for their role on shaping behavior. The first generation learning theories actually did not even think about thinking and problem solving to be or cognitive factors to be responsible for any behavioral changes or any kind of personality dimensions which is uh, existing. How do we measure personality? Up till now we have looked at the theories of personality. Now comes the question of how do we measure personalities. There are three different ways which we will look into here. One is the questionnaire method, the other is called the psychodynamic or psychoanalytical method and the third is called the biological method. So, we will start with looking at the personality inventories. Personality inventories are certain questionnaires which are given to people. Now, these questionnaires have certain themes or certain basic dimensions under which there are certain questions. The people have to rate these questions from 1 to 5, 1 to 7, 1 to 9 depending on the type of personality, 1 being the least and 7, 9 or 5 being the most. So, certain questions are there, I will show you a, a personality questionnaire. So, people have to rate the questions and based on the ratings that they get, add the rating, the personalities can be defined. Now, one of these questionnaires is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI. So, I will describe that in detail. So, questionnaires that assess personality by self-report of reactions and feelings in certain situations. So, these questionnaires have certain situations defined and people rate these situations on certain questions and that defines personality. The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory is one such questionnaire. What does this questionnaire have? They use criteria key method for test, test construction. Items are selected on basis of correlation with external criteria. So, basically here questions are taken and these questions are formed in terms of a criteria. So, remember uh, validity and uh, criteria related validity that we did in intelligence. So, we use the criteria method for selecting questionnaires on this test. Now, the current version contains clinical and validity skills. The current version of the MMPI has something called the clinical skills which defines personality problems and the validity skills which are used for lie detection. Clinical skills relate to various forms of psychological disorders. These psychological disorders could be neurotic or psychotic in generally it is not used for psychosis, but it is used for neurotic. So, it could be personality problems or neurotic problems and uh, these clinical disorders actually can very easily tell the type of disorder personality or type of psychological disorder a person has. Validity skills are designed to determine whether or not to the uh, uh, what extent do people fake their answers on the test. So, certain questions are put there in such a way certain questions are repeated or certain questions are reframed. Now, why this is done? This is done that if people are giving the same answers or different answers to the same question, it is very easy to catch that they are lying. If people are doing it first for fun, then it is very easy to catch. For example, a question is how anxious do you feel? How often do you feel anxious is one question and so you put two here. The same question is uh, says that I feel anxious always and in this question suppose you say it's 6, then the answers are difficult because you are very agreeing with it. On the other hand, you did not agree with it, not too often and so the two answers are different and so this can detect a lie. There is another form of questionnaire which is called the Million Clinical multi axial Inventory, the MMCI. Items here are close to the MMPI scale, so it is very similar to the MMPI scale and there is something called the NeoPI, so we looked at the NeoPI factors, this is another questionnaire which is there, which measures aspects of personality that are not directly linked to the psychological disorders. So, there are different kind of scales which have been used and these scales are also used for measuring percent. So, let us look at uh, the MMPI for that matter, this is called the MMPI 2. As you can see, these are the clinical scales. 
So, you have the lie scale, you have the frequency scale and you have the correction scale. You have uh, personality problem for example, hypochondriosis, depression, hysteria, psychopathic, deviate, musculinity, feminity, paranoia, schizophrenia, hypomania, social introversion. The content scales are anxiety, fears, obsession, depression, health concerns and so on and so forth. And supplementary scales are Welsh and anxiety and McAndrews alcoholism and so on and so forth. So, these are the different scales which have been used in this. There is also lie scale, a frequency scale and the correction scale. Similarly, you have the NEOPI in which you have under neuroticism things like anxiety, hostility, depression, self-consciousness, impulsiveness and vulnerability is measured. In extraversion, warmth, gregariousness, assertiveness, activity, excitement and so on and so forth is measured and you have openness to experience, agreeableness and consciousness and within that there are several other concepts. So, these are the constructs within these, these concepts are measured. Then there are something called the projective test or the psychoanalytic test. Now, what are the projective tests? The projective test presents an ambiguous stimuli to which a person can respond to as he or she wishes and resembles Freud's idea of free association. Remember free association that we dealt? Now, one of the tests is called the Rorschach Inkblot test. What does it has? It has 10 cards with symmetrical ink blots, which are 5 black and white, 3 multicolored, and 2 black, white, and red. Responses are scored as either pair of objects and reflections and movements of color shading and ink blots. So, there is an external system. So, here it is, there is an external system for measurement and scoring. So, basically a card is given to you and this card is symmetrical ink. For example, look at these cards, these are card number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So, different cards are there, as you can see there is a symmetry. So, if you look here, this is the symmetry, these are symmetrical cards and this card is given to you, person holds this card and then what they can do is they can move this card around. And the questions are asked that what do you see here, the kind of movement that you do with the card, the kind of responses that you do, the kind of answers that you give to this card actually reveals your personality. And so, there are uh, 5 cards which are black and white, 2 cards which are black, white and red and then there are 3 cards which are multicolored in nature. Let us look at one of these cards. So, when uh, you can do it yourself, if you, if you look into it, this particular picture, what do you see? So, you can give an answers and these answers will actually define what your personality is. Similar to it, there is something called the thematic perception test, the TAT. And so, TAT consists of 21 cards with card number 11, which is blank and each card has a theme to which the story has to be narrated. Scoring is done in following the something called the need press theory, the defense mechanism manual or social cognition and object relation. So, here a theme like this is given, a photo like this is given and the job of the person viewing this card has to tell three things. First, what is happening now? What has happened before? This situation and what will happen after this situation. So, based on these three parameters, you have to write a story, a half page story, maybe a one page story and based on the themes, based on the words that you use, based on the, the language that you use, certain themes are used, certain needs are uh, extracted from your story and your personality is followed or personality is measured using these cards. Now, there is something also called the draw a person test, which requires to draw a person and interpretation is based on the uh, way the person is drawn. So, this is generally used for smaller children. So, example something like this and in this uh, small children draws the mother and father and based on the length of a year, the number of eyes, mouth, nose, neck or the type of clothing, opposite thumbs, correct number of fingers, legs, etc. Some kind of interpretation is done of this child's personality. Personality can also be measured through other methods. One of the other methods of measuring personality. So, in addition to self-report questionnaire and projective techniques, several new measures are available for measuring personality. For example, there is something called the experience sampling method. Now, what happens in the experience sampling method is that electronic pages are used in this method. So, a patient who comes to measure personality, a patient whose personality is to be measured, he is given a pager. Now, individuals are beeped at predetermined times and made to record their behavior. So, individuals who carry these pages, they are sent a message at different points of time and what these people have to do is to report what they are feeling or what they are doing at that appropriate time when the pager actually is beeped or the pager, uh, beeping of the pager is done. This method can reveal stable personality patterns. So, looking at people's behavior over a vast period of time, over a vast period of uh, behaviors will they will tell you. So, because what they will do is they will at different points will beep them. So, they will say that I am in this situation, I am doing this. Now, collecting this data for a month or maybe for few months will reveal certain personality dimensions, will reveal uh, the fact that these pe people, these person will go into similar situations.
right across time and so his behavior will reveal certain definite or fixed patterns and you can generate those fixed patterns or you can extract those fixed patterns and then define what this personality uh, what this person's personality is all about or how he is relating to this personality there is also interview method for measuring personality and how it is done they can be of two types structured and unstructured. So, in interview method in the structured interview method certain questions regarding people's personality are asked and these people have to uh, give this question for example, how ang structured questions could be how anxious do you feel right now, how sleepy do you feel right now or uh, how many times do you feel uh, negative in, in this world or, or this kind of questions are there and you have to answer between 1 and 5. So, 5 is the highest and uh, one is the lowest. So, here you have to answer within a certain range that is one thing. Now, in unstructured interviews questions are open ended questions are asked for example, how do you feel right now? In a uh, negative situation how do you feel? What do you do in a negative situation? So, here all kind of responses can be generated. So, in one sense in structured questions question is there are fixed answers and people have to give answers within these fixed limits whereas, in unstructured question interviews. Uh, any kind of answer can be given and these answers are then read back uh, frequency analysis a word analysis is done and certain kind of aspects are pulled out from the interviews and personality dimensions can be studied. Responses on items can reveal aspects of personality. So, the kind of response that you give to different kind of items will reveal your personality. And then there is a biological measure of personality and what is this biological measure of personality? PET scans and uh, patterns of brain activity can reveal personality. For example, there are certain people who are criminal, certain people who are uh, narcissistic or uh, do heinous crimes. Now, these people have different kind of brain responses to different kind of situations. For example, uh, brain fingerprinting is one term which has been used for measuring personality dimensions. And so, people uh, who are narcissistic in personality or who are let us say saddest in personality or who, who do heinous crime, they have a different brain uh, activity altogether to uh, certain situations. Now, if I do a PET scan, if I do a brain scan, their brain will reveal a different pattern altogether and this different patterns can reveal different personality types or different kind of people. So, that is how a disordered personality, a sociopath or a psychopath will be differentiated from a normal person. Also, Harman levels can also predict personality. Harman level analysis is a newer level of analysis which is also used for measuring personality. Certain hormones actually are excreted at very higher levels or uh, released at very higher levels and these higher levels of hormone release or hormone count can also define certain kind of personalities or can also reveal certain kind of people who do certain kind of facts and so certain personality types are linked to it. So, basically what we did today in today's lecture is that we continued on from what we were doing in the last class. We looked at what is personality in the last class and we continued by more theories of personality like the humanistic theory which focuses on the goodness of human beings. Looking at the trait theory of personality which believes that personality is governed by certain stable patterns of behavior and then by looking at social learning theory or learning theories of personality which believes that personality is a output of how people learn and how they are rewarded. We looked at an evaluation of these theories and towards the end of this section we looked at how personality is measured not only by using questionnaire method, but also by using projective methods and newer methods for example, like the experience and sampling methods, the interview and the uh, biological measures. Personality plays a big role in how people behave or how human beings behave and understanding human beings can be lot easier if we can categorize people or if we are able to uh, decipher people based on their personalities. In the next section when we meet, we will be looking at social dimensions or how other people around us make us behave in different ways and up till we do that meet next and do that and look at what is the effect of social world around us on our behavior and our uh, behavior on the social world, how we influence them as well, I will say goodbye from you. Thank you.